Well, good morning. Thanks so much for starting your week out with us. I'm Ryan Kalei Suji, joined by Yanji Denise, and this is Spotlight Hawaii. Thank you so much for tuning in. You know, over the past year, Yanji, uh, our conversations have pretty much been dominated by COVID-19, but we do like to also spotlight other issues that are impacting our community. And today we're focusing on one of those uh, issues that continue to uh, be present here in our state. That's right. We are talking about homelessness and joining us live this morning. We have Scott Morshige, the governor's coordinator on homelessness, along with Connie Mitchell from the Institute of Human Services. We're so happy to have both of you on today. Of course, uh, as Ryan mentioned, we focus a lot on COVID-19 and it feels like everything really intersects with that issue. Uh, this, of course, was an issue long before COVID. Um, but we want to find out what the impact of the economic downturn and just, you know, having the pandemic uh, in our community has meant. Scott, let's start with you. What do we know about the homeless population right now uh, throughout the state? So what we do know is the pandemic um, has made homelessness um, clearly more visible in the community. Um, and I think that occurred because many of places where homeless individuals would go to congregate during the day, like, for example, the state library, or other um, facilities like that closed down during the pandemic, and many of them still have not reopened. Um, as far as you know, our point in time count, we um, did not do an unsheltered count this year because of COVID-19. However, we did do um, a count of our sheltered population. And what I think the shelter count showed was clearly the in impact that COVID-19 had on many of our emergency shelters that had to reduce capacity. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, we know that on Oahu, there were 249 um, people in emergency shelter in 2021 compared to the same time in January of 2020. But I think you have to, um, like all data points, just um, put that into context and in that because we did a point in time count in late January, it did not reflect a lot of the emergency efforts we had um, undertaken to expand capacity during the height of the pandemic. Um, primarily using CARES Act funds, much of which, um, you know, those funds had an end date of December 30th of 2020. So, for example, there were efforts to expand, um, you know, a post facility that HPD runs at Kehi Lagoon had a capacity of up to 150 um, at one point in time. There were also efforts by other organizations to open up on um, temporary emergency shelter at Camp Erdman. Um, for example, in other parts of the community. And that wasn't reflected um, because by the time the point in time count was done in January, many of those um, facilities had closed out. I think the other thing the point in time count doesn't reflect is just a tremendous effort that providers like Connie, IHS, and other organizations have done in getting people housed. One of the things when we look at data just from January to April of this year, um, we have about a 55% um, permanent housing placement rate from people exiting from homeless programs. So that means that for the first four months of this year, an average of 500 people per month statewide were being placed into permanent housing. And I think that's a key thing to focus on because although homelessness is more visible, the efforts to help people get out of homelessness, that hasn't stopped. And I think that's really to the credit of um, the frontline workers who continue to this, do this work day in and day out, despite everything else going on in the road. Yeah, those are encouraging numbers, uh, no doubt. And Connie, I want to ask you, you know, we had a conversation early on in the pandemic about some of the challenges that face IHS. I'm wondering if you can update us now on what's happening and what you are seeing right there on the ground. Well, I think just as the community has turned um, from testing to vaccines now, we've been doing the same thing. So we have um, done it out in the public, you know, for the outreach folks that are um, uh, seeing people unsheltered and also within our shelters. Of course, we were really concerned about people coming in and not bringing it in the, um, you know, to the shelters. So anyone who comes in now, you know, we are offering the vaccine. We're also testing to make sure that they're not um, bringing it in to infect other people as well. So all in all, I think we've been stable. We've been able to, um, expand back a little bit in our shelter so that it's not down to the lowest levels, but it's certainly still not up to the levels that we were pre-COVID. Yeah, I want to follow up on that. We had Anton Krucki on here uh, a little while back, a few weeks back, and he had said that, you know, that just because of social distancing, they'd lost about a third of their beds. Um, how are you managing that? And is there a push to open new facilities or, or what can be done to make sure that there is actually enough space for the folks that we see out on the street? 
I think for me, I see that this is an opportunity to invest more monies in um, housing that you know people can actually transition to. And we have so much uh, housing dollars coming through from the federal government right now that we really ought to uh, think about how we can best use those monies to permanently house people. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, expanded, you know, our shelters back a little bit, but we use the Honu, which is used to be the post, you know, which um, HPD runs. We have been working with them and uh, for a lot of the time that we didn't have uh, space, they were taking people and then we were taking them shortly after as soon as we made more space. We're at a um, kind of an equilibrium right now where I think we're able to, um, you know, uh, bring in people very quickly, you know, from the whole new. So that's been very, very helpful to have. You know, oh, oh. go ahead, Scott. No, I was, I was just going to say, I think definitely having the whole new has helped um, to build up additional shelter capacity. The second site at Whitmore Village in Wahiwa added an additional, you know, 40 beds <laughs> um, immediately. And then in addition to the other shelters um, beyond just IHS are starting to build back their capacity. And as you know, COVID restrictions lessen in the general community. The same is true of our providers is that we're slowly um, kind of getting back to that pre-COVID state and additional beds are coming online. And like Connie said, we're also making a push um, statewide actually to bring on additional housing targeted at people coming out of homelessness. So earlier this year, um, Maui um, County opened a uh, um, new project called Huliao um, in Kahului at the site of the old Maui dorms. And that was with assistance of state funding plus county resources and you know other similar projects on Kauai and on Oahu have opened recently as well. You know, in our conversations with the mayor's new homeless coordinator, Anton Kwaki, he had talked about this new approach that the city will be taking in providing more of a mental assistance. And it's not necessarily the first line of the uh, first responders would be police, uh, but rather those who are trained in mental care and providing social services. Uh, I'm wondering how closely, Scott, if we start with you, you're working with the mayor's office on this new approach and, and what are your thoughts about how this will work and, and do you think that this will be an effective change uh, as opposed to some of the other uh, homeless sweeps that we saw with the previous administration and the uh, compassion and disruption efforts that happened there? Well, my my office, um, you know, myself, I coordinate very closely with the city and county. Actually, Anton and I meet um, once a week. My staff has had the privilege of actually being part of the strategic planning meetings for um, the core program he was describing. And I think the approach the state has taken in general is that when we respond to encampments on public lands, and, you know, so often we have to respond to them because they're either in places that are very unsafe or there's other, um, you know, health conditions or circumstances that why those encampments cannot be in a certain place. When we respond, we want to make sure we do so in a way that connects people with other services. And I think the core program is consistent with that. What we've seen in state's approach is we've established coordinators in the Department of Transportation and Department of Land and Natural Resources that can meet people encountered on those lands, assess what their needs are, and then connect them up to organizations like IHS and really um, start to do a better job of identifying those who have mental health challenges or physical health challenges so we can connect them to the appropriate type of resource. Because sometimes shelter isn't the appropriate type of resource. We need to be able to assess and navigate people to what makes sense based on their situation. Yeah, Connie, so the, Connie same um, question. Yeah, I would love to get your thoughts on the city's new core program that they hope to start up in the next, I, I believe it's month or two. So I was also part of the group that's been meeting, you know, to just provide some uh, feedback and input around the development of CORE. And um, I'm really happy to see another uh, entity that's gonna be uh, available. I think 24 seven is what um, you know Anton was talking about. And it is um, one that is really linked to EMS. You know, so we'll have that capacity to deal with the medical as well. I wanna say that we have been really working hard to reach out to mentally ill people as well. Um, our, our outreach team at IHS has a component that really um, has been working with some of the most chronically homeless people. And that program has been funded actually by both um, Adult Mental Health Division on the one hand, and then um, the legal part funded a lot by um, the city. So we actually are doing some work, um, you know, trying to help people uh, get guardianship if they need it, like if they don't have um, decisional capacity. Also, um, the assisted community treatment, court order treatment for people who need it. We really feel like that's an important component, you know, to really get some of the folks help that really need it, that cannot ask for it and are always refusing it. <clears throat> so yeah, I early, think, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. 
I just want to say, you know, so a lot of our work is trying to locate people's families because that really helps us, you know, to be able to execute a guardianship. But for the most part, I just want to let people know we haven't forgotten those people at all. Yeah. And to expand on that connection and having maybe a family member, you know, early on in the pandemic, we had heard these stories of people flying over to Hawaii with one way tickets. And uh, if they didn't have a relative or if they didn't have a place to stay, obviously everyone that was coming into the state at that time was being tracked. Uh, and the state was actually sending them back, or I shouldn't say the state, but private uh, or organizations were sending those uh, individuals back to where they came from. Uh, is that something, Scott, that you are continuing to still see people flying here to Hawaii, um, knowing that they don't have uh, a housing situation in place, but are maybe just more comfortable living uh, on the streets here in Hawaii as opposed to where they're coming from? I think that that does happen that we see people who make the decision to come to Hawaii because in the hopes of, you know, a better life for themselves. And a lot of times they're not familiar with what um, the economic climate is like here or what the housing situation is like here. And I think in those cases, um, you know, the providers do try to make a family connection with those individuals to connect them to a place where they can have stability and support. Um, I, I want to emphasize, though, that the number of people who come in from out of state is a very small portion of the um, people that we see experiencing homelessness. Many of the people experiencing homelessness in our community are local people, and many of the people who come here from out of state, they're people who make that choice on their own. They're not necessarily being sent by another um, state or um, city jurisdiction. I also wanted to add that during the pandemic, you know, um, while people were being sent back after a while it kind of slowed and there weren't that many people that were coming but we have noticed you know with the opening up of the state that we are seeing more people coming in again scott i want to follow up on something that connie actually said with the you know the intersection of uh first responders ems particularly with the core program um and working with you know uh, health care providers that are you know helping us every day uh, those paramedics are already working so hard just to meet the needs of our community are we thinking, you know, you know, is the core program, and I know it's a city program, but I know you're working in conjunction, so I'm just interested to know, you know, we only have a limited number of ambulances to respond to the, um, to the needs of people who are having heart attacks and getting in accidents and what have you. So how would that actually work? Will core, and just for our viewers who are not familiar, this is an idea brought up by the city to uh, stand up resources and basically dispatch folks instead of HPD so that the first responders are, you know, are not law enforcement, but actually services, uh, social workers and, and medical professionals. So how is that actually going to work? And do you, are you at all concerned that that will stress that resource that we already know is so taxed? Well, I, my understanding of how it's going to work, I think, is to really divert people from the emergency department. And we know that our hospitals and emergency departments are really overtaxed right now. And um, the idea is that we're able to assess somebody, triage, um, if we have options currently available to them. Like I mentioned, those options, it could be as simple as something as providing transport to the Honu, but it could also be transporting them to new resources coming up in our system, such as um, stabilization beds, for those who may be dealing with mental health or substance use issues. And that work is actually starting right now. So just to give you an example of it, um, you know, about a month or so ago, um, there was a, you know, my office got a call about a 75 year old individual at a city park. And, um, you know, that person had a lot of complex medical needs. We were able to actually um, divert him from EMS, have um, an outreach worker go out to respond to them, have them transport it to a stabilization bed that's funded through Department of Health. And that person just having a roof over their head and having support um, provided to them, their situation turned around in a really short period of time. And the outreach staff working with him was able to connect him to a Section 8 voucher. And he's since then um, started to transition into permanent housing. So I think the goal is that we'd have similar type of outcomes at core. If we're able to assess someone's needs and determine it's not um, appropriate for emergency room care and we do have other resources in the system that can accommodate it, we're able to quickly triage that person to the appropriate level of resource and support so that we're not overwhelming our emergency department. Connie, I'm wondering if you can expand a little more about what you're seeing right now with those who are coming into IHS and, and different homeless shelters here. But uh, what are you seeing in terms of the percentage of maybe those individuals who are actually getting into housing? Uh, are you seeing a successful uh, return on that? And, and are people making advances or do are we kind of 
still seeing those chronically uh, individuals who continue to get go on the street and then come back into the shelter. What are you seeing in terms of just the overall progress of that we're making here? I think that we are definitely making progress with the added housing uh, resources that have been provided. We are uh, moving people out of the shelter quicker. We are definitely connecting them up with the right kind of housing. As Scott mentioned, you know, not everybody goes into independent housing. Some of them have a higher level of need, and that certainly is what we are seeing at our shelter. Is that you know we see people coming from the hospitals a lot. Um, we created other shelters. Our specialty shelters are for people being discharged from the hospital. But even beyond that, there's a lot of folks that are coming in chronically homeless with chronic me um, mental illness or chronic uh, other illnesses that really need attention. And over the pandemic, we uh, developed a new clinic at our men's shelter that actually is helping a lot of folks stabilize a lot better. We also um, hired on more nurses. You know, so we're actually doing more um, like medication management, you know, helping people stay on their medication so that they can actually benefit from whatever is prescribed to them. So, you know, I, I do think that the acuity of people is going up. And another area is that we're finding um, more people, and this is very common, that there are a lot of chronically homeless people who have um, traumatic brain injury or now, you know, are so long on the street, you know, they're starting to suffer dementia as well. So that's another group that we're really trying to develop some solutions for. You know, Scott, in the paper this morning, there's a big story about the Oahu Housing Now program. I'd love to get your thoughts on that. And I know a lot of people are very concerned that when the governor's uh, moratorium on evictions expires in August, that we are going to see a new wave of people uh, who are homeless, who perhaps have never been homeless before, uh, but find themselves so far behind on rent that they just can't make it. And now they have that uh, eviction record. And so it'll be that much harder for them to get a new place to live. So if you could tell us a little bit about the Oahu Housing Now program and what your concerns are about what might come in August. So um, Oahu Housing Now is a new program that's come online as a result of CARES Act monies. Um, it's funded by the city and county of Honolulu, um, operated by Partners in Care, which are, is our coalition of homeless service providers on Oahu. And that program um, aims to house 300 people by September. They're already a quarter of the way there. Um, they've housed about 75 households to date, about over 180 people within those households. So I think it's making a big difference in just um, about a two month period. And um, we really wanna continue that push. And part of that is reaching out to landlords um, to help us you know, really be able to maximize all the federal assistance coming down the pipeline. Because in addition to um, Wahoo Housing Now, the city and county of Honolulu opened their section eight um, housing voucher wait list um, today, and they'll, they'll be taking names all this week. And then there's additional programs coming online later this year, emergency housing vouchers to the federal government. So we really want to make sure that we're reaching out to landlords so that we have um, uh, the infrastructure in place to be able to quickly rehouse people if they fall into homelessness. I think the other thing is we're really working with all the providers to do outreach about the need for mediation. So for those who may be um, at risk of eviction, to encourage them to um, go through mediation with their landlords to negotiate time to be able to make a transition. But really it's um, putting the infrastructure in place and really trying to reach out to landlords about so we can utilize all of the resources coming down the pipeline. I think the other thing in terms of what we have to anticipate is we know um, if you, we just look historically at what happened the last time Hawaii went through a major economic recession. Again, it was nowhere near the level of magnitude what we're seeing now, but that was back in 2009. And if you look at the point in time count data from that time, there was an increase of about 37% or over 2,100 homeless individuals over a seven year period between 2009 to 2016. So I think if we're not able to maximize all these resources, if we're not able to bring landlords to the table, we do risk a similar gradual increase over a period of time at a much le greater level of magnitude. So I think it really is urgent that we reach out to those who may have a unit in their home to rent so that we're able to connect with them and transition people quickly out of homelessness as rapidly as we can. You know, we know that, of course, it's, it's not only about getting them uh, into homes, but also helping them to stay into homes. Yeah. I mean, I think that is another critical component in, in all of this. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, maybe, Scott, we'll start off with you. 
what kind of services are being made available to ensure that even once they're in the home, that uh, how long are uh, services provided to them to continue to help them during this transition period? So for this Oahu Housing Now program, for example, it provides 12 months worth of housing subsidy. It provides case management for that period of time, wraparound supportive services. Um, there's also similar programs that provide different levels of support, both financial support and case management. I think the goal always is, again, not just to get somebody into a home, but to make sure that they're able to retain the housing over time. So that supportive services piece is really key. And I think um, Connie is probably able to add to that because I think her organization runs um, a number of these types of programs. So remember, there's a lot of different types of people that might be facing homelessness. So we have homeless prevention programs that catches people before they actually become homeless, which is a lot better because it's a lot less um, uh, resource intensive to you know help somebody stay in housing than to actually get somebody out of being homeless into housing so for those people that never were homeless before we're hoping that homeless prevention money will be uh, continually made available so that they'll get the help that they need and they don't really have to become homeless we also have rapid rehousing monies you know that are helping people like um, the Oahu, Oahu housing now program other programs, the state has a program, the city has a program now. There's more money that is av available. Um, I understand that the last time they opened up last week, um, every time they've opened up, it's, you, you know, they're used up all the vouchers and um, that were made available and they had to get more people to actually help people because there wasn't enough help, you know, to actually execute those. So this time they hired more people. Um, they didn't have to close down. There are still funds available for people. So if anybody knows anybody who is um, really behind on their rent and they um, have been impacted by COVID, that is a great um, opportunity to get the help that they need also. So I'm really um, trying to be hopeful that with the, a lot of the funding that has come through from the federal government, that many people will avoid becoming homeless. But as you mentioned, Ryan, if there's not su supportive services, because so many people are kind of on the edge, you know, they really are one paycheck away. And now they've been many paychecks away. But if we can take care of that part, if we can also bolster their um, sustainability, you know, by helping them maybe even get a better job, you know, or, you know, find um, a way to get take advantage of another um, program that maybe could help cut their costs or help them with child care and things like that, um, it would really make a big difference. The child care piece is really helpful for helping some of the folks who are doing child care now uh, be able to work. So if somebody else is able to take care of children, they're able to work and actually pull down more money for their families. Yeah, Connie, I want to follow up on that child care piece because we know that so many homeless, um, particularly homeless that you don't necessarily see, uh, are mm -hmm. families or single parents. And I'm just interested to know your conversations with the DOE because we know that school is such a stab stabilizing force for a lot of these kids. It's where many of them eat um, some, if not all, of their meals. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you're hoping you know kids can get back into school in the fall so at least they have that in-person learning and also so their parents can work? Right. I think that, you know, um, with DOE planning for the reopening of schools you know, in the fall, um, I'm hopeful that really a lot of the children will be able to normalize. I can't tell you how painful it's been to watch how children have been impacted by COVID. When they couldn't go to school, couldn't socialize and be with their friends, um, it was very, very difficult for the kids. You know, we're seeing a lot of mental health issues around that also. You know, people just not having that opportunity to get the support that they need. So, um, you know, and then also the, the food. A lot of times the um, children may get their main meal from school. You know, they have um, lunch, but they also, many of them have breakfast as well. So they get fed twice at school for many of the children. So we're hoping that with school opening up, we'll be able to actually, um, you know, resource the families a lot more so that they, um, you know, will have enough, you know, for the children as well. You know, Scott, we're seeing a number of projects that are coming online that are specifically targeting uh, this issue. Uh, most recently, I know that I was out in Kalailoa, and I believe it's Kohale uh, Village, uh, that project with Homemade and, and Hale Partners that they put together to build that community there. Uh, you know, I wanted to get your thoughts on those types of projects. Do you think that those are things that will help this problem? And, and do you foresee more of those types of uh, environments popping up uh, throughout the state? Oh, yeah, yes, definitely. I think we need a range of housing um, to meet the different needs of people we see experiencing homelessness in the community. So that project out at Kalailoa, you mentioned my office is very involved in that. 
we're working closely together with the Lieutenant Governor, Homeed, and the other partners to bring that project online and make sure that there's supportive services provided as well as the communal housing model there. As I mentioned, we've worked to identify new projects on Maui, um, that Huliao project I mentioned earlier, um, a project on Kauai, Kealala at Pualoke, um, projects underway on Hawaii Island. And right here on Oahu, um, last year, we opened the Kumobai Senior Housing Project in partnership with the city and county of Honolulu that um, targeted senior um, homeless seniors and provided them with supportive housing and supports. So I think we need to look at um, continuously look at different models of housing, see how we can utilize both city and state resources to um, combine our efforts and really um, bring on a variety of options because it's not a one size fits all solution. Our time is running out, it goes so fast, but Connie, I wanted to, to just hear from you. If someone is facing this, if they're worried that they're in danger of be becoming homeless, um, what is the best course of action, especially because you know we talked about August coming up and, and these are folks who never thought that they might be in this situation. You know, At the start of COVID, we saw those long lines at Aloha Stadium for food assistance. Um, a lot of those folks receiving that for the first time. So for someone who may be facing the situation or maybe they have a friend or family member who is facing this, what's the best best thing they can do right now to prevent themselves from ending up on the street? I think to act now, you know, we really know that um, if you wait till the very last minute, it's much more difficult for us to assist. So if people are knowing that they're vulnerable, call right now, call 911, or not 911, 211, sorry, Aloha United Way, or um, call or go online and go to Wanuahu, um, you know, dot org, I think it is. Um, and, you know, the city's um, the website, you know, to get help there. And then you can always call IHS, ihshawaii.org um, is another website that you can go on and, you know, tap into the housing resources that we have. And if we can't help you, we'll d direct you to somewhere else that, you know, you can get the help that you need. But the more time that we have to help you, better. And Scott, for you, as we wrap up here, for those that are watching, you know, there are many people who want to give back and want to help out. We've seen that through this pandemic uh, and the outpouring by the community uh, in a number of different ways. I'm wondering if you can just provide any context of how people can get involved or, or any other final suggestions that you might have on what the state needs right now. Maybe there's a business out there that's looking uh, to provide service. What, what are some ways that people can assist? I think there's always a need for volunteers. Like I mentioned earlier, there's a need for landlords. If people um, want to help and just are not sure how, I encourage them to contact my office. Uh, we can be reached at 586-0193 or by email at govhomelessness um, at hawaii.gov. Oh, great. Well, Scott uh, Morshige and uh, Connie Mitchell, thank you so much for taking time this morning and for all your work uh, on this, this effort. We know that there uh, is so much to be done, but we continue to uh, see some of those great numbers that are coming out and, and the number of people that you are helping as well. So we thank you so much for your time and for your efforts uh, on this issue. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you. you. You know, the rate, the big takeaway there, Ryan, is is what Connie said. Uh, if you or someone you know is facing this, the more time they have to assist you, the better. So call 211 if you're at all at risk. There are a number of services coming online. If you go to StarAdvertiser.com, you can see the, that piece today in the paper about that Oahu Housing Now program. Uh, that's going to help a lot of people. There are millions of dollars flowing in the state specifically to target housing and to help the um, people who are at risk of becoming homeless or who are homeless already. So we see that there are the resources there in a way that we haven't seen in the past. And hopefully that can prevent uh, that wave that we uh, have heard talked about coming in August. Yeah, and we're excited to just see how this core program is going to be unveiled. Of course, we've been talking about it from some t for some time with, of course, Anton Kwaki, with our guests here today, as well as with the mayor and those individuals who've been working hard on this new approach to battling and, and providing support, I should say, for homeless uh, here in our communities. And so we know that that's coming online soon. So we'll continue to see how that unfolds and how that's working out. And hopefully we can get an update from those who work closely with that program as well in the months to come. Yeah, and good to hear from Connie Mitchell that vaccinations are being offered to those uh, who are at risk, who are who may be on you know unsheltered and uh, out there and, and needing that service. So we want to talk more about the vaccination program, and we're going to be doing that with our guest on Wednesday. Lieutenant Governor Josh Green will be joining us. Um, he, of course, is leading the state vaccination program, also uh, heading up safe travels, and there's some uh, changes that are happening this week in that arena. So we'll be talking about all of that with the Lieutenant Governor on Wednesday.
That's right. And then on Friday, we're going to be talking with the director of labor and industrial relations uh, and Ferrari stock wheel will be coming on board. We know that there are still, of course, many questions about unemployment, uh, as well as the future of what that looks like. Will the governor and the uh, DLIR continue to provide that 300 plus up from the federal government? We'll get an update on how things are looking over there at the unemployment office. Again, that show is on Friday. But uh, until uh, Wednesday, we thank you so much for being a part of this conversation. Have a safe week. We'll see you right back here then. Aloha. Aloha.